You are listening to 91.7 FM WSUW in Whitewater, Wisconsin. Let me spin you a tale. Imagine a country so vast it covers 12 different time zones. A country rich in oil, gas, and timber. Yet a country that imports everything else, including gasoline. A country where value of money depends on the price of a barrel of oil. A country ruled by a security agency where those objecting get sent to prison, shot, and poisoned. A country where TV battles the refrigerator. A country where people can't decide what is worse, to stay silent or to speak up. A country where George Orwell's 1984 is a bestseller. Now imagine you live there. You're listening to Rashkin Report. You're listening to WSUW 91.7 FM, The Edge in Whitewater, Wisconsin. This is Yuri Rashkin, and you're listening to Rashkin Report. Uh, my next guest is Natasha Yudinseva, who is a lecturer at International Relations at Columbia University. Welcome, Natasha. How are you doing? Hi, Yuri. Thanks for having me. How are you? It's it's a pleasure. Uh, you are a specialist on Russian oil industry, and I am very excited to be able to talk about this because uh, Russia and oil have a long history, and it seems like um, maybe this is you know needs to be put in perspective first of all, and we need to explain to the listeners how Russia got involved with this oil industry because right now it seems to be a big big percentage of its uh, uh, just the profit for the country the income for the country comes from oil and gas how did it get there can you talk a little bit about that well yeah you just want to talk a little bit about the history um, Russia always have been involved in uh, oil industry and uh, actually oil uh, especially oil uh, experts have been uh, for long term for uh, for a long time, uh, there have been a huge support for uh, Russian budget. And uh, if you remember Gorbachev times, actually Perestroika started because the economy um, became crumbling and prices were down. Uh, and that uh, helped actually the dissolution of the uh, Soviet economy. So Russia always Russian budget always dependent uh, depended on uh, for a long time let's say uh, depended on um, oil and gas industry, and uh, it oil plus gas uh, exports constitute um, I'll say uh, like forty five no fifty well, almost fifty percent of the budget, um, and oil only oil is around thirty eight percent of the budget, and uh, those. As you mentioned, during Gorbachev's time, um, the price of oil was quite a bit lower than it is. Well, it, it, it still was lower than it is now, but in the early 2000s, uh, that's when the, the beginning of Putin period in Russia, that's when the oil prices spiked. How did that change Russia? Yeah, he was very helped by oil prices. What happened, well, Russia was, was and is blessed with a, a lot of oil reserves, um, and I would say with a lot of easy oil reserves because there were a lot of um, big um, big oil fields uh, that uh, were very cheap in terms of when they started to operate. Uh, it was very cheap in a way, no brain um, operation. Um, right now, the cost of uh, lifting of oil is like from five dollars per barrel till fifteen barrels per per, uh, per barrel, uh, because oil right now in Russia actually getting uh, more uh, expensive uh, to uh, produce. But back then, it was cheap. It was like around three dollars uh, per barrel. So uh, when operation was um, there. You know, uh, oil was just was going for export, and um, Soviet Union was getting dollars for that. Uh, then there was dissolution of uh, the whole uh, of the Soviet Union. Um, 
oil price was down during Yeltsin time. Uh, so during Yeltsin time, actually, privatization of uh, oil companies started, which act- gave a lot of push uh, uh, for the development uh, of oil companies. And that was the time when a lot of foreign companies came for the investment uh, to search for uh, oil in Russia. Um, Natasha, let me ask you this, something that uh, I, I think I found always, I don't know, either puzzling or amusing, yeah. but how many, um, how how much are Russian people themselves involved in extraction of oil? Are this done by, uh, how how much of the work is done by the Western companies who develop uh, these oil wells and then, you know, man no, them? Russians, Russians a lot. It's when we were talking about uh, investors, uh, foreign investors coming to Russia in, you know, in this uh, wild 90s. Uh, yes, that was the case. But you have to remember, uh, at that time in, in the 90s, there is um, no technology. Uh, there is no money. So there is no way Russians alone could do at that point, at that point, uh, could do anything. And actually, uh, when ExxonMobil uh, came and like some other foreign companies came and there was some production started at Sakhalin, it was very good uh, for Russians uh, because you have to borrow money for that. And Russia didn't have any cre- um, credit history. No one will even like loan money to that. So the they were for first time, first time buyer. Excuse me? They were first time buyer. They, they had no credit history. They didn't show that they could make payments yeah, on the car. Yeah, that's a huge risk. Horrible, that's right? huge risk for uh, anyone to loan money. So the presence of uh, uh, reputable uh, foreign companies with a good credit history was very beneficial for Russia. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able even like to start operation. Uh, when Putin uh, came to power, it was somehow already, well, the prices, he was very, really, his, uh, uh, his presidency was helped very much uh, with the rising of uh, oil, uh, oil production and uh, oil uh, money. Uh, so that basically brought the wealth uh, to Russians. And um, I can say that there are a lot of um, foreign companies there. There are some, but uh, a lot of Russia, you know, a lot of oil, especially under Putin, actually started to, uh, oil industry started to consolidate and under the government. And basically most of the production is done by Russians. And what is the status at this point? Because um, the dynamic that I'm seeing happening in Russia is similar a little bit, I think, to what we saw in 2008 in the United States, where you have a crisis of some kind, and that allows uh, the big players to consolidate a lot of the resources in their hands. How is that playing out in Russia now that they're having a crisis, albeit um, you know a lot of it is politically motivated? Oh, what it depends what crisis we're talking about. Um, <laughs> well, what what I'm saying is that now that Russia is under sanctions, um, and, and you know they're calling it crisis, but you know I'm not sure it, if that's the right word yes, to describe it, it either. Let's start from the beginning. Yes, Go uh, ahead. Russia has like several problems. Um, first, uh, before even like uh, all happened with Ukraine and before the sanctions uh, and um, falling of the oil price, there was a lot of talk that Russia has to diversify its uh, economy because it's in a way, it's a weakness of the economy when half of the budget depends on uh, export of two fuels, uh, oil and gas. Absolutely. Uh, so... Uh, they started, as you remember, this innovation programs and, um, you know, Medvedev was, uh, you know, trying to kind of like develop it. Um, people from oil industry were saying, uh, guys, yes, let's start innovation. But actually, a lot of innovation happens from the development of oil and gas um, industry technology, which is absolutely true. So don't uh, really kill uh you know, the baby, uh, don't throw it with the water, uh, and let's develop everything. Uh, So there was this back and forth, um, but because oil prices were extremely high and there is a lot of potential, still a lot of potential in oil right now, uh, because when we're talking about oil in Russia, there are like three 
parts we can talk about. There are con conventional oil, which uh, production of which is declining. There is uh, unconventional oil, shale oil, wh what we have here in the United States. And Fracking. Russia has tremendous mm -hmm. reserves there. But it's a little bit, geology is a little bit different. And plus, they don't have uh, so much innovation in technology. So it's not clear how that will be. It still has to be developed. Uh, plus Arctic, of course, uh, offshore Arctic, which is uh, right now in embryo development. But again, the potential is huge. So um, excited by all this potential. Um, but Russian but companies. Russians, if you know, they've, if, as I understand it, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but they were not really hot on the fracking because they thought that was a trend that was going to pass. Um, well, they were not hot on the fracking about shale gas. And still you can hear from Gazprom, oh, you know, shale gas, it, it will pass. You still can hear uh, this, uh, you know, claims from Gazprom. Uh, they got very hot, hot on uh, shale oil. And actually, they do, Bajana Formation, Western Siberia, where traditionally Russia has most of the oil, under this um, uh, under these oil fields, there is another formation which is shale oil, and which uh, carries enormous uh, reserves, according to uh, U.S. Geological Survey, by the way. And that was the 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 time, and it was several years ago when um, actually a lot of, you know, Russian companies and Rosneft including was saying to um, America, uh, mostly to American te technological companies and service companies, please come help us. So there was a lot of kind of, uh, you know, ajetage, right, excitement uh, uh, around that. Right. Uh, and companies were going to go there and develop uh, shale oil. Uh, then you... Plus, as you know, uh, ExxonMobil and Rosneft started uh, to do um, some drilling um, in Arctic. So, but yes, potential, yes, there are a lot of potential. But this potential, they all coupled, they all tied to uh, U.S. technology. That's the problem right now for Russians. So when the sanctions happened, and sanctions happened exactly, there was like targeted uh, sanctions that prevented exporting this technology and prevented um, U.S. companies to go there because it's not only technologies, you need to know, uh, you need to uh, have know-how, right? You need to have management, right? Management for that project. Uh, then Russian uh, Russian pro these projects started uh, were put on hold. At the same time, a lot of analysts, were, Russian experts, were saying, "Guys, forget about this Bajana formation. Forget about Arctic. We still have a lot of um, brownfield uh, oil." What does it mean, brownfield oil? That it's old uh, oil uh, wells that were put on hold, but with a new technology, you still can dig and you can get a lot of oil there. And there is technology right now for there, also coming from the West, but Russia already has this technology. So what happened this year, 2014, 2015, under the sanctions, when Russia found itself under the sanctions and everybody expected that oil production will go down, it actually went up. Why? Because Russians finally started to develop, using new technologies, started to develop these brown, uh, brown fields. So would you say that the sanctions have been effective or have they not been effective? Yes and no. They have been, uh, they pushed Russian to develop this brown field. Which is a good, uh, which is a good thing, but of uh, yes, they've been affected. Uh, sanctions kind of like they been affected in the long run because it's on, not only technology; it's also finance uh, affected. And um, Russian companies right now, like Rosneft, um, Gazprom, they cannot borrow on uh, world mar capital markets for more than. Um, like th I believe for some companies for 30 days and for some uh, companies for 90 days. So it's a very short, uh, you know, borrowing period and then they have to refinance. So it's very expensive. It's extra round, extra round. So, there, so the capital markets are available and open, but only for short 
short-term borrowing for 30 to 90 days. Is that what you're saying? Yes, for uh, for oil and gas companies. Not where for where oil, are they supposed to get the long-term companies. financing? I'm sorry to say? Where are they supposed to get long-term financing? Uh, that's an interesting question. They went to Chinese. Um, and, you know, that's why there was the whole, you know, all over the China. Right. Uh, the, the, the big turn to, to the east. Right. right. However, Chinese not West. And Chinese are not ready. There is not so capital actually in China available. Also, and Chinese don't use to um, loan money so easy as the Western uh, uh, part of the world uh, doing it. Uh, and West um, also, so the rates are very high, much higher than uh, Western loans. Uh, also, Chinese prefer not only to loan money, but like to participate and to get some part of the equity uh, in the projects. So it's completely different terms, and Russians are not very happy with these terms. Listening to WSUW 91.7 FM in Whitewater, Wisconsin, The Edge. This is Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. We're speaking with Natasha Yudinseva, who is a lecturer at international relations at Columbia University. Um, she's been working a lot studying the subject of Russian oil, and it's, uh, uh, it's exciting to have you on the program. Um, so, um, so the so Russia makes this big turn from west where she where Russia has been dealing for years and supplying gas and oil and then all of a sudden you know not all of a sudden but sanctions happen and Russia has to turn to the east and Chinese as you're saying they're offering money on much higher interest rates than the western lenders banks whatever plus they want to participate and they want to have equity don't you think that considering how unreliable um, dealing with Russia can be that r- Chinese approach may be more functional even if it's less liked in Russia? In terms of, you know, Russians can, you know, they can sign contracts, but then they don't fulfill the contracts. Maybe maybe this is, maybe they're more suited to Chinese way of doing things where, you know, we're going to be here, we're going to make sure it gets done. Uh, I wouldn't agree. Okay. You know, with all um, Russia and unpredictability on the political side, uh, Russian business has pretty much uh, has been pretty much reliable in terms of dealing with the foreigners. Really? Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yes, they um, they pay their debts. Um, so uh, and they try to fulfill the contracts. Yes, we know this um, uh, famous story about Sakhalin, Russia, and uh, Shell. Oh, but I don't want. Right, I I don't know if you're interested. I mean, that's that's a long story. I can give you another kind of like side of the story about the shell. But when everything has been resolved, uh, Shell actually is pretty happy, like we're uh, working with Gazprom right now. So um, I wouldn't. I, yes, Russia has a lot of problems, uh, absolutely, and I would say it's mostly political uh, unpredictable. Unpredict- unpredictability but uh i wouldn't i would say that uh russian business side um 
they're pretty much, you know, they're trying to hold their word. So, and, and you consider them to be fairly reliable business partners when, from, from their, you know, now that, now that they have established credit history, you consider that their track record has been pretty good. Uh, yes, in terms of, uh, for example, finance, um, yes, th their dealings are pretty good. All right. Uh, um, is, talking, yeah. uh, shifting the conversation a little bit, there's a, a company named Yukos. Actually, a company existed. It no longer exists, I understand. And uh, the former shareholders of this company that was uh, the leader of it was uh, placed in, in Russian prison for 10 years. Now he's semi-leader of opposition in exile, uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky. And uh, the court, international court, I think in Hague, found uh, that Russian government was somehow liable. I don't know the details other than now Russian government owes $50 billion to the former stakeholders and shareholders of Yukos. Um, yeah. What, what do you think, uh, what are your thoughts on that situation? Um, I think it's, uh, uh, it's a problem for Russia. Uh, it well, they're saying they don't own anything and they're not going to respect this decision, uh, which they put themselves kind of in a trap because they are dealing, you know, with international, uh, and they claim that they oblige international laws. So uh, I think the Yes, the decision is harsh, I have to tell you. Like 50 billion, it's a lot of money. And uh, I think um, they they were, there were some expectations that Russians would start negotiate and will kind of like negotiate this, you know, low price. But right now, I think they are on the hook. And um, uh, what, what is happening from what I hear, there are some, um, uh, freezes right now of the, S, uh, of the S, uh, freezing of the assets, uh, started, uh, all around, uh, the world right now. Yeah. So uh, that's a problem for Russia. Well, uh, we'll see, we'll see how that resolves. Uh, but, um, uh, it's, it kind of goes back to the, the idea of the bigger players swallowing up smaller players for a variety of reasons. Well, um, we we're talking about right now the political decision. Again, that was absolutely a political decision. Yes, it was, of course, Rosneft, uh, but it was done with the help of, you know, Surgut Neftigaz, that is, um, you know, Surgut Neftigaz, for example. There are several players right now. Yes, uh, right now, uh, industry is helpful. Um, and uh, there are not much players uh, on on the field, so uh, the whole Yukos, uh, you know, thing has been done with the approval of uh, the top person, you know, in, in the country. So that that is the, the there is always the political problem in Russia. That's that's the highest the, the highest risk. How do you see um, American players and foreign players now approaching Russia? Besides caution, are they considering Russia to be toxic? Are they considering Russia to be just let let's see what happens after Putin? Uh, or are they saying we can't wait to get back and do business some more? What what do you see? Um, I. Tell you the truth, I don't see much movement right now towards Russia. Uh, because, uh, yes, theoretically, um, let's say prices are coming up and it's and it will be lucrative to go to Bajenov, to go to Arctic and all this stuff. The problem is that um, you never know. Uh, I think the problem right now for Putin, it's his unpredictability. Unpre what other political movement he is doing? Is he going to war with uh, Turkey? Is he going to war with uh, Ukraine? What is happening now? He's going to uh, at war in Syria. So, uh, and politics definitely uh, trumps uh, right now economics uh, from both sides uh, of the uh, of the Atlantic. So it's very unstable uh, business uh, environment right now. How are Russia? So I don't. See, I yeah. can't. I can't uh, see uh, companies. Let's say even sanctions are off. Uh, I can't see companies are moving very quickly to Russia just because you never know when what will be the next move, and then, then sanctions will be back again. 
Um, I was listening to an interview with a person who uh, made a really interesting distinction between, he said there may be money being put in Russia, but it's not long-term investment, it's speculative investment, somebody that tries to get money out of this quickly and, and there's no long-term uh, investment. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. That I can see. I can see someone is playing on Russian uh, currency right now. That I can see. But uh, when you're talking about oil and gas, it's always long term uh, long term investors. All right. And uh, like to make um, any investment for like fifteen years for and decisions to make these investment decisions, I just don't see companies are doing right now. This companies who are there, they're there. You know, they were allowed to to, to stay. Let's say uh, Exxon Mobil, uh, they had to stop uh, developing Arctic uh, with Rosneft, but uh, they're still working with Rosneft on another project in Sakhalin. And um, there is, a high, you know, sweet uh, light oil is developing in Sakhalin and uh, they're sending it to Europe. So it, it's, you know, companies are still there. Total is still there. Um, I think NI is still there also. So there are companies who worked uh, on the project before, um, they allow it to continue. Natasha, how do you view the policy of the United States, how it changed under Barack Obama in terms of um, fracking, in terms of um, agreeing now to sell oil? Um, how has that affected not necessarily even world markets, but Russia's future as an oil producer and oil supplier and gas supplier to the, at least Europe? Mm, well, fracking actually uh, started with Bush uh, administration, um, and it started like uh, quietly, and it started in reaction of uh, to th- uh, September 11. Uh, shale uh, was um, shale, you know, was known for a long time, and it was known that there was a lot of oil and gas in this uh, shale formation, but always it was known that it's very expensive and uh, it's not economically feasible. So uh, quietly Bush administration started to support, uh, you know, the the, the technological developments. So gas started under Bush. Oil, uh, I think the the first oil appeared 2009, something like that. So I don't think it's like policies, uh, uh, you know, Bush or Obama, uh, and I think actually oil, uh, the whole fracking thing happened despite uh, Obama policies. Okay. Uh, But uh, I think it has been very successful for U.S., and uh, shale gas development made us, you know, uh, absolutely the, the first market, the first producer in the world. And we became uh, in, uh, completely independent from uh, gas imports, which is absolutely great for us. And we managed to uh, bring in a lot of um, overseas, uh, you know, companies that uh, in, that uh, are enjoying our uh, cheap energy and, um, you know, creating manufacturing and everything because it's, you know, the energy is so cheap. Uh, so we have been lucky with that. We're sending uh, a lot of cheap energy to Mexico, and Mexico started booming on that cheap energy. And right now they're doing uh, their oil and energy reforms just because they see how successful U.S. is um on um, cheap energy so uh yeah we have been lucky with that in terms of um oil production um the truth is it's not clear for how long we'll continue it may go for 10 years it may go for 20 years it may stop in 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 10 years you know we don't know because if you look around uh, on the map it's only like few spots um in us where we can drill for oil uh, there is much more uh, shale gas right now known like as reserves than oil. We don't know maybe technologies, new technologies, because technology is developing all the time. Uh, very fast, uh, there will be new, something new uh, f- found, but it, it's not clear. Plus, we have... Um, we have to solve the problem of water because, let's say, Permian Basin and Eagle uh, Fort, it's Texas area where there is um, a lot of uh, oil coming out from shale. We don't. We are very um, 
short of water there, of water resources. So it's mostly we use underground water. There is also the use, instead of water, uh, gel. Uh, it's, a, it's a big problem right now. So it's, uh, not, so it's not just a simple, you know, we just start doing it and, and gold comes out, so to say. No, 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 no. no, no. no it's, it's a lot of innovation. It, uh, it requires a lot of innovation. But our industry is very flexible. We have uh, thousands of players, um, and that allows uh, the industry movement. And plus, you know, shale industry really changed a lot because we were talking uh, with you that oil and gas, it's a long-term investment, right? right. Uh, and so you're planning for many, many years. That's very true. However, shale uh, oil allows much quicker investment and much quicker return. It's also depleting uh, shale oil, um, shale oil wells depleting much faster. But you also, as an investor, you get uh, you know faster return. Return on your investment. All so right. uh, actually, um, a lot of companies that wanted to invest, a lot of foreign uh, investment were coming here, and we pulled. Actually, that was actually uh, probably our effort, um, um, our distinguish uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, the most of the investment came right now. Uh, lately, came to uh, the U.S. shale and oil, rather to Russia, because. Uh, you know we have uh, we have regulations, we have laws. It's much more clear. It's much more stable political environment, uh, more stable uh, business uh, environment, more welcoming, and uh, the return of investment more quicker, more faster. Listening to WSUW 91.7 FM, The Edge in Whitewater, Wisconsin. This is Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. Uh, we're speaking today with Natasha Yudinseva, who is a lecturer in international affairs at Columbia University International Relations. Um, we're speaking about oil and uh, Russian role in. Uh, well, having been, a, as a Senator McCain described, a gas station to the world, a gas station with a country attached, now that uh, oil prices are down. Natasha, how are Russian people taking this? I mean, obviously, you're, you know, you're in New York, and uh, but you travel to Russia on a regular basis, and, uh, and obviously because of, you know, as you keep going to, for perfectly good reasons, situation is tied in on the political angle, more so than economical, and uh, political means that, uh, you know, there's basically one person who is in charge of everything, and I think people feel fairly disempowered. But yet they see that their country is completely reliant on this one or two sources of income for the entire to feed the entire you know half the budget. Um, how are people reacting to this? What are they hoping for? How are they handling the lower gas prices, or not gas prices? But actually, lower. you know, for Russians, it's not low. Believe it or not, it's I, I think they're raising right now gasoline prices for for Russians. Um, there is. A lot of complaint, just you know, on anecdotal level, that uh, a lot of businesses, you know, uh, like small businesses, are cut down from from the income. It's still, um, I would say, Russian economy appeared to be more resilient than it was expected. 
it's not in pieces, still not in pieces at all. I think. So, they so as, as I think President Obama said at State of the Union a couple of years ago, that or last year, a year ago, that Russian economy is in shambles. You would disagree with that? I, you know, I can't tell about the whole Russia because I didn't travel all Russia. I was in Moscow. Okay. In Moscow, you basically don't feel it yet. Sure. But here, the thing, yes, uh, most uh, of the currency uh, is, um, you know, brought by oil and uh, gas. And of course, yes, Russia right now is very nervous because a Russian budget was um, planned on uh, $50 per barrel. Right now it's $30 per barrel. So, and let's say lifting prices, as I said, for oil from 5 to 15 so this and um, Russian government starts to tax um, oil and ga- uh, oil uh, companies when it's more than 20, uh, 25 per barrel. So basically there's not much left for the budget right now, but there is also not much left for the oil companies to invest back. So it's, it is, a, you know, uh, edgy situation for Russia with oil, and that's why they're traveling around the world and trying to, uh, negotiate with OPEC countries to um, cut the production. I don't think they can negotiate cut the production, but at least they negotiate right now for freezing the production. It's kind of an interesting situation because uh, freezing production on the level as it is, it seems like almost max for Saudis, and it seems definitely max for um for Russians, because it is expected that from uh, starting next year, production will slowly start go down. So that's interesting. So rather than say, you know, so because in the news reports, they reference on a regular basis lately, as you mentioned, Russians are trying to negotiate and uh, lead the effort uh, to, you know, to have decline in, in production. But when they say freeze, that really doesn't mean stop. It just means don't do Absolutely. any more than we're doing now. Um, Keep at current levels is the freezing. Right. It's it's not in the interest right now in, okay, here the thing, but for technological reasons, Russians really cannot stop the production. It's very cold there. It's, um, you know, it's all in Siberia. It's Western Siberia and Eastern Siberia. It's very cold and plus it's old technology. They can, they're not able to stop. It's not easy for them to stop as for is, Saudi. For is, example. It, is, it, is it like one of those that if you turn the faucet, the faucet breaks? Right. So, okay. <laughs> and this also, yeah. Okay. So, okay. We cannot do, uh, they cannot do that. Uh, now, uh, plus, Saudis, they also understand that when they stop the production and the moment price go up, our shale companies here in U.S. come back and they start and they start to produce. Because right now, what's ha- what happens in in U.S. a lot of wells put on hold; they are actually closed. But any moment, you know, the price is up, they're coming back and they start to develop. So it's all over the stories all over again, right? Um, and of course, everybody, and we have Iran, who just came from uh, from sanctions. So they're not in the mood to stop or freeze their productions. They actually, they want money for, for their oil. Uh, because for really, Iran, every dollar that they get is a dollar they didn't get before. Absolutely. So they, they don't care and how much they sell it for. Have, and we have Iraq. Um, which seems to me, I think they agreed to freeze uh, right now uh, the production. But, you know, it, it's interesting situation. Uh, Russians are running around the world trying to kind of like put on hold everything. At the same time, Lukoil, one of the largest comp- Russian largest company, is one of the major producers in, in Iraq, and they continue to, uh, to produce oil. The same as, you know, Western companies are there. But what I'm saying, it's uh, not black and white. So is this that there, I mean, I presume that there's some sincere efforts on the Russian side to try to control the flow of oil, but they're actually not able to lower this, their own production. So are they hoping that they're, other countries exactly. will lower their production? Uh, they're not ready to, they, they cannot lower their own production. Uh, I don't think uh, Luke oil that is producing in Iraq is, you know, willing to lower their production. Um, and OPEC, yes, the, everybody wants higher prices, but uh, nobody really wants to give up their market share. And I think the prices will come up eventually because at some point you do need to 
invest back in, into the industry. I think there is a major actually issue than just a cyclical issue of uh, of a production. Uh, how much oil? Um, I, I think the issue is is the era of oil is coming. I would not say to the end, but at least like flattering, and then uh, after some years will come to the end. Because look what's happening with the renewables, look what's happening with electric cars, and I think there there is a future. Maybe and not and that's, then that's, I guess, what I wanted to ultimately kind of get to is, is exactly as you're saying that technologies are changing, and uh, yes. you know we're we're moving. I think we're moving away from oil, although. I've seen that announcement that Ford is announcing four new SUVs, and I presume that those are going to be on gas and probably, you know, with lower gas prices, there's a kind of possibility of getting us hooked back on oil. But the technologies are still there, and Elon Musk is not giving up, and, you know, Tesla is optimistic. So how how do you see this whole thing playing out in the next five, ten years? I think, I actually, I think it's, yes, we, of course, we're hooked up on, on, on the cheap oil and uh, SUV, for four-wheel drivers, you know, still, uh, absolutely still there. But I think people, anecdotally, but what I heard from, and I hear it more and more, people, when they uh, change to Tesla, it's not only about that it's you don't go to to the pump uh, like to put oil it's just the whole um you know um the whole the new like a lifestyle uh, mindset the, kind of a thing is so uh attractive that people don't want you know to think about uh, other cars at all so i think it will get more and more uh, and plus, it's not only electric car, which, of course, you know, oil is mostly we use for transportation. But uh, think about uh, trains, if uh, the new trains, well, first, uh, they're the thinking about like using LNG as a fuel for, for the train. We, knew, we know Buffett uh, is uh, doing this. Uh, I presume LNG is liquid natural gas? Yes, uh, okay. liquid natural, yes, a liquid natural, uh, natural gas. Plus, uh, we hear these talks about a uh, vacuum train, the, and that's an, uh, not uh, even talks already. Ring, there is a pilot uh, train right now they're putting together, I think, in Nevada. Uh, so it doesn't need any oil. It, it, it works in a completely different concept, right? It's vacuum train. Uh, so there are... You know, the, the technological, um, you know, thinking is really developing fast. So I do see maybe like in 10 years and we're, or maybe like in 15 years, but we're also talking about that oil needs like long-term investment. And if you're a long-term investor, you're thinking, where would you put your money in this new technology that are very promising. And by the way, we also had this uh, Paris Convention where we're talking about uh, climate change and that we need to cut emissions. Or you, So are you putting your money into oil or you're putting your money into the new and promising technologies? Natasha, if you were, you know, if, if you were in Putin's shoes and uh, and you had as much power as he does, what would you try to get Russian economy to do in the next five to ten years? What should Russian economy be doing? Uh, um, I think it needs to get its... Um you know, because it's it's uh, it's one thing to analyze, and it's a lot of fun, but how to move forward and and where to go from here when you have um, sanctions, when you have people that you have brain drain that they have in Russia, where all the smart people seem to be getting on a plane and getting out of the country. Um, okay, there is still a lot of smart people left, uh, and uh, what I would do, I would really do privatization. They're talking about privatization for a long, long time. Uh, like 2012, 2013, it, it felt like it's already, it's there, right? Uh, it's not happening. And it's still not happening, believe it or not. Um, of course, it's not the best time right now for privatization, but I would give a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, all economy to the private hands. That's what I will do. And I'm sure there is enough, uh, you know, business spirit left in Russia 
even let's say you have sanctions, even let's say it's very kind of, you know, difficult politically right now, uh, if you would give it to private hands, but you really need to have to enforce, to be able to enforce uh, the law of private property. Right. That will work. However, as we see right now with the latest development, with this ruining, you know, and taking away from Moscow streets, uh, the little private uh, shops. Yeah, they, they just, uh, for, for those listeners that may not be aware, a few days ago, uh, Moscow government having lost in court uh, with a lot of these people who build um, in the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of shopping centers and strip malls um, all around Moscow near like subway station and such. Just overnight, about 100 different uh, strip malls were torn down. There's no, um, you know, there's really no authorization for it other than the government said it's going to do it. And then the mayor of Moscow came out saying uh, with like a, a tweet or on in the Russian of Kontakti, I think, which is a social media, Russian social media announced that, you know, you just can't cover yourself up with these papers claiming private property. It's just not going to work anymore. So private property and private ownership and the right of ownership in Russia is very much in question. It's absolutely shocking what happened. It's like really shocking. Um, yes, I agree. Maybe actually, from the aesthetic point of view, uh, maybe that will be uh, better than you know the, the look. They're, of they're clearing out the streets from all those businesses. But it's <laughs> unbelievable what is going on. So, uh, but if you, if I would be, you know, if I would have the power to do that, uh, I That's would. That's the direction that. that you would go in: is yes. to privatize uh, the the companies. That to people really. And I'm sure people will have enough uh, ideas, um, you know, to, to, to develop business. Um, I was just listening to Dorsch, it's, it's a Russian, you know, uh, alternative uh, TV station through internet. Sure. And uh, they were talking, they were laughing about, they were trying to privatize right now, um, uh, what is it, uh, but... Uh, vo- uh, Volgogradskaya masla, Volgograd butter, the producer of the butter and milk, uh, milk and butter producer okay. in Volgograd, uh, very famous uh, place. They're trying. They were talking about privatization, and for some reason, again, it's not happening. So, the le- it seems like the level of corruption is becoming unbearable. Right, and. Uh, so we don't know if the the Putin for Putin it's a, a bar, uh, it's his pillow the corruption he's right now talking about corruption fighting about corruption but it seems the corruption and the whole system is a pillow for his power if that's the case he will never be able you know to take it down and if the corruption will be still there. So I don't know what business we can talk about. Right. Well, and the the, the idea of privatization, while I think it makes perfect sense um, because of competition, because of having different people who come in who are private sector, who maybe are more motivated, have experience in the field, all of those reasons. Uh, the Russian form of privatization just means usually handing over a piece of state to some, you know, to Putin's close friend or associate, and and that's called privatization. Or you know, so it's not really how yes, it's supposed so to it's, be. It's all the, the the same, you know, small group of people who are benefiting from that. I think the major democratic uh, movement move they did it was before actual Putin. They did they gave uh, people. Uh, they allowed people to privatize, uh, privatize their apartments. Right. And that actually gave the whole push in, uh, for the development of the real estate market, which is still there. Um, other than that, um, I don't see major... And of course, in the 90s, when it was complete collapse of the economy, they gave oil, uh, uh, you know, oil industry to the private hands. And even it was, deen, it was done... Um, unfair how many people complain and it was it's still the, uh, the the industry became alive compared to the gas industry which never actually been really privatized and that's why it's kind of like so clumsy interesting yeah. you're listening to wsuw 91.7 fm 
The Edge in Whitewater, Wisconsin. This is Yuri Rashkin, and this is Rashkin Report. My guest is Natasha Yudinseva, who is a lecturer at uh, Columbia University, a lecturer in international relations, um, specializing in, in Russian oil industry and developments of such. Um, Natasha, what do you think, as we're nearing the, the end of our conversation, what do you think is going to happen after Putin? Oh, <laughs> You know, because he, he, this is one of those situations because of the, as you mentioned several times, when you have investors who are concerned about the political instability, well, everything depends on the fate of one person right now. And this person could be there for a day, a week, a month, or a year, or a decade. Um, and it seems like not much is going to change until he leaves, you know, one way or another. So... What what is the hope? What or what do you think is actually going to happen when he leaves? Do you think that there is going to be peaceful times and new international development, or is there? Do you think that's more likely to expect a, a collapse of the country and, and a breakup of the country? I hope not. I you hope, hope not. not. Okay, Can, um, I, the, you're not very clear on the microphone right now. If you could. Again? Uh, I can't hear you. Uh, this right. right oh, can you there. hear me now? Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, I hope country will stay. But you know, it, it is it is an interesting. Uh, well, we can you know we can talk a little bit. Um, it's a very interesting situation right now uh, with um, Tatarstan. As you know, uh, there was a, a Tatarstan, uh, uh, you know, Auton- uh, Auton- uh, autonomy republic has its own president, and they call it the Tatarstan president. And they came up with the issue, some Russians saying, oh, why we kind of like have two presidents for the country? And uh, the, uh, you know, the central power, uh, the central government kind of go along with it and they were not able to do anything. I don't think they like it, but they're not able to cut, I would say, this position of the president, Right. So one of the um, major and best companies is Bashneft, uh, uh, Bashneft uh, Oil that is actually doing very well uh, right now, the best player and uh, the oil market in Russia. Now, uh, and it belongs, uh, you know, after long different situations with the company, it, it was part of Yevtoshenko. Uh, Vladimir Yevtoshenko uh, conglomerate, but right now it's back uh, to to the republic. So now uh, federal government is talking about uh, Bashneft privatization. Uh, rep- uh, rep- uh, Bashneft, uh, uh, I mean Tatarstan, uh, Tatarstan state, I would say, Tatarstan Republic, Autonomic uh, Republic says, we don't know anything about privatization. We are not going to privatize uh, Bashneft because that's the major, our money cow, if you want, and it's our major asset. And we are not even talking about this and not giving comments about that. So it's an interesting situation right now. Uh, in oil industry, where federal government sees the only asset is is good for privatization is Bashneft is the best asset for them, and Tatarstan is saying no, 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 we will not we will not allow to do this. So the question is, who trumps whom? Will uh, federal government interest will trump Tatarstan interest or vice versa? And that's the development to watch. But when you're saying about um, the solution of Russia, that may be, um, I wouldn't say the first steps, but maybe at some point Russia will turn into this federal federa- federation, where, right, where, um, you know, not states, but, you know, re- autonomic uh, republics will be more uh, autonomic than they are right now. So- we don't know. So when, whenever Putin leaves, you expect the, or suspect that Russia may gradually shift into a federation of um, regions. Uh, we don't know where, uh, under what terms he leaves, uh, who will follow him, uh, but at the same time, we don't know at what point what the economy will be at this moment. All right. Uh, because if it will have strong economy, you know, 
it will stay together. And it, well, and how you know both what is the price of oil and what is the demand for oil is going to determine a lot of well, Russia's future. I have to to be fair. It's yes, oil of course is very important for Russia, but right now Russia actually exporting a lot of arms military uh, military to India, to China, to Azerbaijan, believe it or not, to Iran, I believe. So, um, and military right now, uh, there's a huge investment goes, uh, Russian investment goes to military development. And it's getting pretty strong, so don't forget about that. So that's also, you know, Russia always was a strong uh, arm, expo- uh, um, uh, arm exporter in the world. Plus, they have know-how for nuclear power. And they go around the world, um, also like developing countries, and they build uh, nuclear power plants. That's another way, you know thing like of exporting their skills and um, know-how things. They were, till recently, they were one of the major exporters of uranium to to United States, by the way. Not many people know about that, but that also was happening. I don't think it's still there, though. But Russia has still has resources, metals, land, by the way. And I think what is happening right now, they are um, basically selling, unfortunately, very unfortunately, they're basically selling land to Chinese. When I'm saying selling, I mean they're giving to lease. They're leasing it for... 50 years at a time or something. Right, like 90 years or something. 90 years, wow. Natasha, what are your thoughts on, um, as we're wrapping up our conversation, we should take a look at the presidential race and uh, and just kind of quick uh, look at the, you know, there's fewer candidates now than there were even a month ago. Um, (laughs) Who who do you like? Who do you not like? Who do you think has a more functional approach, in your opinion, to dealing with Russia and how we should be dealing with Russia? I am sure whoever will be the president... um, Yes, they will, we will, you know, U.S. will have to deal with Russia from, in any case. You know, Russia is a big country and it's impossible, you know, just to put it in the corner of the world. Um, how to deal, um, well, first we need to, dis- we, we have to, uh, we have to understand what's going on in Syria. And I think Syria right now and ISIS is the major thing. Okay. Right now, and that's in in the both interest to stop ISIS, uh, at least, you know, for US and hopefully for Russia. Um, and um, it depends uh, how Ukraine situation will develop, and a situation with other uh, former republics, because there is a lot of claims right now from uh, Baltic states that uh, Russia. Uh, permanently, not permanently, uh, very often breaks their airspace. So what does it mean? Uh, Do we need to support uh, them? Do we need to put more, you know, NATO uh, army there? I mean, it's it's very difficult questions. I'm not sure just in the last two or three minutes I'm ready to talk about this. All right. Well, it's clearly a fluid situation and as people keep saying about Putin, he is not a strategist. He is a tactician, and uh, he's um, and 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 he tries to take advantage of every situation. So, check your daily news and see what Russia is doing today. Um, Na- uh, Natasha Udinseva is a lecturer at international relations at Columbia University and a guest uh, on the program today. Natasha, thank you so much for your expertise and your time. Is there anything else that you want to mention before we wrap it up? Oh. Uh- just I hope that uh, if, uh, thanks for having me first, and second, if we ever will have this conversation again, I hope it will be more rosy conversation and more, you know, exciting things will be happening in Russia and in the world. Thank you. You are listening to 91.7 FM WSUW in Whitewater, Wisconsin.